Thanks to everybody for tuning in today for the Connective Tactical Workshop. Um, hopefully today I can shed a little bit of light and shed some experiences and techniques and things that we've managed to introduce or implement into our business that's allowed us to work successfully with real estate agents being our number one referrers. Um, so without any further ado, we'll get started. Okay, the first slide, just to give you a bit of an introduction about our business. Um, Aquafi I started Aqua Financial Services in 2011. Prior to that, was working as a mortgage broker uh, with a company by the name of Loansite, and I was there for about eight years. And previous to that, started my career at ANZ Bank, funnily enough, working in mortgages uh, and working in collections. So it wasn't hardcore collections, it was just ringing up customers that were a few payments behind um, in their loans and making payment arrangements to get back on track. Some of the real estate agents that, we've, that we now work with uh, are listed here on the, on the slide. They're some of Melbourne's leading real estate agents. Um, Morrison Kleeman, um, Chisholm and Gaiman, one of the Woodards franchises, Dingle Partners, Gary Peer, Point Cook Real Estate, Jazz Stevens, Maxwell Collins and Thompson's um, also. So you can see there that it's quite a diverse group of agents. They are scattered pretty much all across Melbourne um, and beyond. So it just gives you a bit of a feel of the demographic that we work with. It's very, very broad. Um, some of the key things to making sure that, or when I'm talking to potential referrers um, and also our existing referrers, being mainly real estate agents, you'll appreciate that they work extremely hard on their customer service. They're probably market leaders in terms of ongoing service to their clients, um, things like you know, photo albums when people settle on properties, uh, really good CRM systems, um, you know, just they focus a heck of a lot on customer service. Um, for a successful relationship to work with referrers, we need to complement that service. It's absolutely imperative that the customer is going to, or the referrer believes that the client or customer is going to receive the exact same service or better from using a mortgage broker or using you, us as mortgage brokers, and that is how they become confident in referring our service. That's a very, very key point. And we'll talk more about the service that we provide and how we complement that service because a lot of my follow-up that's been implemented in, 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 in our business that the brokers that work with me or for me, uh, we all follow exactly the same model. So. I'll go into more detail on that in, uh, in that model or on that model as we work our way through today. Um, of course, our service is free. Uh, that is a big selling point. Uh, we like to make the most of it while we can. Um, there is an exception though to our rule and it is something that we've only implemented in our business recently is we were always a broker that never charged for our services. We were quite happy with the remuneration we, we received from the banks and lenders. However, just recently, we've implemented a fee-for-service for customers that are seeking bridging finance that won't have a loan at the end. So there is a, an exception to that rule, but it is something that we relay to our referral partners that currently um, our service is free. Now, the next thing is to go through with you guys just a few examples of the type of information and the type of discussion that I have with real estate principals when we're trying to win them over to refer Aqua Financial Services. So on this slide here is just some things that prompt discussion points. The biggest point that I'd like to make about the referral um, venture or referral business, for it to work, we as brokers, we must put in the work. It's not something that comes, um, it's not something where you can turn up put a few cards over the counter at a real estate office and then expect leads to roll in. It just it won't work like that. Um, what I mean by um, work is that there are things that you need to be doing to make sure that the real estate agents stay engaged with your business or with you as the broker and have you top of mind when they're thinking about chatting to um, potential buyers or potential sellers, whether or not they're at open for inspections, um, and that interaction is what will make sure that they remember you when the finance question comes up. Now, another important thing is, is I find that real estate agents 
don't necessarily naturally know how to raise the question about finance. Um, so we do little things to help educate them. We provide little scripts and little bits of dialogue just to help them introduce that discussion to their clients. Because the way I see it is that, like we do, if we're gonna go and see a customer of an evening and you know take time away from our family, I'll often use a document that I've got in the office to qualify my clients to make sure that we can work with them. You know, By no means, if they're not in a position to buy, does that mean we run a mile? No, definitely not. We, we just have a different strategy in working with them in getting them into a position to buy before we sort of go out and spend hours at night in their lounge room. So just little things um, like that. And the benefit to making sure that the real estate agent is dealing with, well, the, uh, dealing with the right broker is that we can make sure that they're actually in a position to buy the house that they're interested in. The real estate agent wants to, wants to know that their buyer, so that they can push their offer through to the vendor, is qualified and make sure that they've got the finance in place, whether it be through a pre-approval, um, to make sure that they can afford the properties that they're looking at. Because the agents don't want to waste their time um, um, either and show people um, to properties that they may not be able to afford. Now, in terms of other benefits, of course, there's the benefit of additional income. We pay for our leads, you know, I don't shy away from that in any way, shape or form. Um, I think that it's a really good incentive for the real estate agents to refer to us. Um, you know, they're salespeople, they're hungry, you know, and, you know, in that type of industry, money makes, does make it, it definitely, it definitely has an influence on, on the way that they think. Um, now, I'm just going to skip to the next slide, just to show you the type of um, referral payment model that we implement. This just gives you a bit of an idea here. So generally speaking, the real estate agent out there that works with us will receive about 0.1% of the loan amount. So on that example there, if you're going to, if they're going to, if they're kind enough to give you a referral for a loan where the customer borrows 500,000, as a, as a rule, we would pay them $500. As, you, as everybody out there uh, watching and listening knows, on a loan of uh, $500,000, if you budget on receiving 0.6% uh, from the banks, which is what's probably the most common, um, you know, we, we'll earn $3,000 from that referral. And parting with $500, in my view, um, is, is a no-brainer. And another reason that I, that I say that is because if you, just, if, you, if you are worried about paying a little bit of money this is just my view, paying a little bit of money for a lead, it's a very, it's very sort of um, small time thinking or, or narrow thinking because what's effectively going to happen is that if you can excel with that client, have the process run really smoothly, keep them up to date, I'll show you some of the techniques and some of the processes that we've implemented that, uh, that work for us, they will then refer to their, to, their, to their brother, to their sister, to their family, to their friend, and all those leads that you get from that advocate from helping that client the first time around that cost you $500 uh, is minuscule compared to the introduction of other customers that they will introduce you to. It's absolutely the way to go in my view. Um, of course, we can do bigger loans, so the referral fees are higher. On a million dollar loan, generally, we'd earn about $6,000. So paying a referral source or paying a real estate agent out there $1,000 for that, again, you can see there that it's still quite good, um, it's still quite good remuneration to the agent. $1,000 sounds like a heck of a lot of money um, for very little work on the agent's part. But from our point of view, think of the doors that that opens um, as long as you make sure that you do a, right, uh, do a really great job. Um, if you're not doing a great job well and you don't get referral sources, it's certainly not going to be as effective as it is if you're absolutely excelling and exceeding the customer's expectations in terms of outcome and service in every single instance. Um, we do do a little bit of sharing trail. It's not something that I have a heap of experience in yet, but I do keep my uh, eyes and ears open and hear about who we're competing with and what other what, 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 what other brokers are doing. So it's something that we've definitely got on the radar just to make sure that we're keeping, um, keeping ahead of the game and not 
um, falling behind in what, what else is available or what other incentives referral sources are receiving from mortgage brokers. We'll just go back to that other slide. Um, in terms of the referral process, for a real estate agent, it's very, very simple. Um, we generally like to ask the agent or we try and get them to introduce our service to their customer. Um, by doing that, it just means then that we can obtain either an email or a phone number. And we find that the strike rate of, if you've got the customer's contact details and you're ringing them or you're able to call them because it's a warm lead that's been introduced from the real estate agent, the strike rate of getting in front of them to potentially um, work with them and help them with their loan requirements is far greater than if you, if, the, if, if your referrers are out there are saying, um, you know, here's Daniel's details, give him a call when you're ready or give him a call when you feel like it. That to me, just it just doesn't work. Whilst it does happen and there are customers out there that prefer to work in that, that fashion, um, we'll absolutely um, uh, welcome that type of lead but if we, are in, if we are able to obtain the contact number, and of course it's, you know, it's been agreed upon by the client that they're happy to pass on, um, you know, the agent's happy to pass on their number to us to call them, the strike rate is a thousand times better. You know? If you ring them during the day at work and they can't chat, um, you know, it's very easy for you to call them back after hours because you can control the amount of contact you have. Generally, as a rule, you know, we don't want to be seen to be um, badgering customers or being too aggressive in our approach. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to leave a message for a customer and then hear from them some time later. It might be a week, it might be a few days. Um, as a rule, we will try and give them a call perhaps three times. If we've left three messages and we've had no response, uh, we, we, we will stop there. Um, I think that that's probably just something that's acceptable and reasonable. Generally as well, unless it's otherwise advised by the referral source, um, we will try and ring them during business hours to begin with. Um, the logic behind that is just, I know myself that I probably don't really want to receive phone calls at 7 or 7.30 at night. Um, and it's just try and treat the referral source or the potential customer, just the way that you would feel comfortable being treated and when you would like to be contacted. And if you ring them during the day and they say, look, please give me a call back after seven or eight or something like that, that's fine. But the whole relationship then gets off to a really neat and a really um, positive start, okay? Um, so getting the contact number f from the referrer or from the agent in our case, and making that contact or having control is the key. Now, how do we get that phone number? Um, sometimes the real estate agents will ring me. They'll ring me from an open for inspection on Saturday and I'll quickly have to jot down the number. So you always need to be in a position to be able to take those details down. It just is not, because your referrer is, is, is as important, in my view, as, as the customer. Because without them, you will not be able to, well, you won't meet the client. and you need to be able to take that lead however it is convenient from the referrer. So if they ring you and say, can you jot down um, so-and-so's number, it's, oh no, hang on, wait, I'll call you back, I've got to find a pen, it's, yeah, no problems. And with iPhones and smartphones, everybody has um, the, the notes section um, in their phone, so it's so easy to pop in the notes. Um, I'm no, no IT guru, I don't use technology to its, to its full advantage, um, I text myself. So I just type my mobile number in, quickly jot in the customer's name and number and send a text to myself. So that's some, one way that you can be, um, you can jot down the number without saying, look, I'll call you back or something like that. So again, it's providing a great service without making it challenging for the referrer to refer you. So that's just as important. So text message is great. Um, also, so we're happy to receive text messages. Agents on weekends um, and when they're showing houses that open for inspections, they're not in the office. They're, you know, they're at the home or they're in their car and, you know, just receiving a text message when they're on their way out of the, um, out of the open for inspection. You know, I met so-and-so, they seemed really keen. I had a chat to them about um, their finance and they're open for a discussion. 
So a text message with that name and number is absolutely fine. Um, email also, um, of course with email these days being on mobile phones, you can easily flick off an email just as you can a text message. So we'll take the leads any which way we can, but I know I've said it already, but I really do, I really would like to emphasise the fact that you have a far better strike rate of meeting the customer if you've got their contact, de contact details rather than having, rather than you waiting for them to renew. So that's something that I find is very, very important. Um, another advantage is deepening relation for the, for the real estate agents and the referrers is deepening relationships with their clients um, by working closely with an advisor regarding their probably their biggest purchase um, of their life. Now, if the real estate agents, you know, trust you and they become friends with you or your referrers, I should say, sorry, I keep referring back to agents, that's just our model, um, and the customer receives an exceptional experience, an exceptional, exceptional service and experience from the broker, well, they'll ring the agent and say, thank you so much for passing on uh, Daniel's details. Um, you know, he's been able to have the loan approved in a timely fashion. Um, he came out to see us or we were able to see him at a time that was convenient. Um, and just having, when, when you refer somebody and that experience is exceptional, um, you know yourself that as a customer, you go back to that person and then you just go, thank you so much. So it really does build a stronger connection with the real estate agent being the referrer and the customer um, as well. So it strengthens their bond and their relationship knowing that they've got, or they can refer to trusted advisors. So that's very, very important. Um, the other thing that I'd like to touch on as well is right at the start of this um, slide, I mentioned that referral referral partnerships, they take work. And you know, I could, it, it couldn't be any further from the truth. Um, dropping off a few business cards here and there and hoping for a result, it's just not gonna happen. So other than the service that you give to the customer, treating the referrer like they are your customer, because you know, they are your customer, just in a different way, um, staying engaged and providing the real estate people, uh, whether it be the whole office or the salesperson or the directors of the business, whatever it is, you need to keep them up to date with what's happening in the industry. And a relevant topic of what I'm updating our referrers with right now um, is the changes in lending. So everything that we're, all the challenges that we're facing now, <coughs> excuse me, based on the tightening of customers borrowing capacities, um, extra compliance, additional documentation that we're now having to source from clients to, to um, you know, to confirm living expenses and validate living expenses and all that type of thing. People that have been looking for property for ages in certain price brackets now may not be in a position to buy property in that price bracket. So it's great if we can give our referrers a bit of an understanding of what's happening and why this is happening. So I'm going to go through a presentation of what I'm showing our referrers right now to help to help, you sh to help show you the type of information that I think is very valid to keep them informed um, of what's happening in our industry. So this is just a bit of an example, oh sorry, uh, this is just a bit of an example here. The key challenges and what we're seeing is the fluctuations in interest rates. You know, you can see from that little graph down the bottom, you know, a couple of years ago, it was the one interest rate for all loan products. Didn't matter if it was for investment, owner rock, interest only, it was really, really easy to quote interest rates. You know, back then as well, I don't even think that the banks were doing pricing or they might have just started implementing that. So, you know, it just used to be so easy to provide a product comparison and a quote on what product, on what interest rate and things the customers would be receiving. So this is how we cover that off and make sure that our referrers know what's happening in our industry and it also gives them some really useful tools to talk to their clients while they're out showing houses and at auctions and that type of thing. So, the major changes in, uh, in bank interest rates as a result of some of the key shifts in the environment. So, this is a bit of a, a, bit of a summary. You can see now that 
you know, back in the back in the day, if, well, I say back in the day, you know, a handful of years ago, if the RBA lifted rates, so did the banks. If they dropped rates, so did the banks. Not the case. We know that now. Banks are changing their interest rates um, outside of what the RBA are doing. You know, you'll often read about, you know, one bank's lifted interest rates this week, one's dropped them the next. They've lifted rates on investment interest only and discounted them on principal and interest home loans. So that just says to the, you know, so that just says to the referrer that, you know, that we, we, we all send emails about what the RBA has done in terms of interest rates. And if you look back historically now over the last, you know, 12 months or longer, the RBA in fact hasn't moved them. But interest rates have changed massively. Um, not just on, you know, not on home loans, of course, but on other types of lending. So it's just a really good way to keep your referrers up to date with what's happening in the market. Um, also, the pricing of loans as well. So, you know, people have heard in the, you know, I'll often sit with a customer and they'll go, oh, we're worried about rates going up. And they're looking at, looking at applying for a home loan that's principal and interest. And I go, well, look, you know, in actual fact, and if you look at that graph, those interest rates since 2016 on principal and interest home loans have steadily reduced. People hear the news that rates have gone up, but they don't specifically understand exactly what rates have increased. So we explain this to our real estate agents out there and they'll often say to me, just quickly, oh, what's the best rate around on the market? And I'll go, oh look, ING's home loan P&I uh, under 80 is pretty good at 3.68%. Um, but again, if they're talking to investors, it's a totally different discussion now. So you can see the discrepancy between owner OCK P&I up to investment interest only, that's, that's over a full 1% um, difference in interest rate. And having the real estate agent understand that means that they're probably not going to quote an investor an interest rate of 3.68% and then you look crazy when you turn around and tell them that it's 4.5%. So again, it's just giving your referrer the knowledge um, to help them have more accurate discussions and help them with budgets um, in terms of working out what rental yields are and what costs are and things like that for investors. So it's all about arming them with as much information as you can to and, and educating them to have better conversations with the people that they will refer to you. And again, that will hence that will strengthen their relationship that they have with the clients as well. So it's a win-win for everybody. So that's a bit of an example. Um, of, how, uh, of what we've been talking about. On the next slide is further information that we're providing our referrers in terms of what's happening. I touched on the borrowing capacity. So they might have had customers looking, or investors, looking to purchase property. It might, have, might be taking them 12 months to find the most suitable property. And now they're actually not looking at properties between seven and 800,000, they're looking between six and 700,000. And you know, by explaining this to the agents and your referrers, they can understand why that's happening. And the main reason for that is with all the changes of what's been happening in our industry with the scrutiny around living expenses, the increasing in assessment rates, the changes in how banks are looking at ongoing payments of interest only loans upon the expiry of the interest only period, has had an absolute huge effect in customers' borrowing capacities. The other thing is the treatment in which they now look at overtime, allowances, um, commissions. Look, I work with agents, I'm very familiar with how their commission structures work um, and explaining to them how their borrowing capacity is now drastically reduced because banks are now assessing commission at 80%. Um, it's just information that's very, very important that we need to get everybody to understand. And you can see from this graph here that based on those changes, it's made a difference of just a fraction over $100,000 in what, under that example, of what that same client on that same income could have borrowed back in 2015 compared to 2019. So that's a full $100,000. So that's an absolute substantial drop in what um, customers have been able to borrow and investors have been hit even further with a decent investment portfolio 
and how they're now assessed in terms of borrowing capacity has been affected the most. You know, I've seen customers or I've got customers out there that have got multiple properties. They document or they do their budgets on the spreadsheets and they look at their payments and everything works on paper, but it does not work now based on the way that the banks are assessing loans. So it's very important in my view to make sure that your referrers uh, are reasonably educated um, in the information and the topics and things that they're discussing with the customers that you're hoping they're going to refer to you. The other, this is another bit, look we deal with real estate agents all across Melbourne, some inner city, some out in the suburbs um, and some in regional Victoria. Um, it's important to give them this information. I think it's, very, you know, it's really important because then they'll be able to talk to customers that are looking at certain properties and advise them or just talk to them about certain things. And what I mean by that as a prime example for us is that a real estate agent could potentially be um, talking or showing a property at an open for inspection that's say 38 square metres in size. It's a really small one bedroom apartment. They start talking to the potential buyers um, and then if, they are start, if they're talking to the buyers and they're just talking numbers and going through that just as a general chit chat, if they are armed with this sort of information that I'll go through with you, they can really have a proper discussion with their buyer. Because if you're a first home buyer trying to borrow 95% on an apartment that's 37, 38 square metres in size, you're not going to get the loan. Good luck. So you just, by giving agents this type of thing, um, and what I'm specifically talking to about here is size restrictions, um, allows them to have a much more in-depth discussion. And as part of that discussion, it allows them to say, well, all this information's been provided by our broker, um, you know, whoever it may be. Um, why, don't, why don't I get him to give you a call or get her to give you a call? And they'll be able to explain what we mean by these size restrictions. So it's all about constantly providing information, not only to your clients when you see them, but to your referral sources. Like I said, it's very important that, that, that they have a bit of an understanding of what they're talking about to their clients. So size restrictions is a very important one. Another one that we see a little bit of is working with inner city real estate agents is restrictions around types of titles. Um, now, it doesn't come up all that often, but it's important that you are 100% up to date with this and we've actually got a quick reference guide that we send out to the real estate sales teams upon request showing which banks will lend on these different types of titles. And what I'm specifically referring to is company share and stratum titles. Now, as you know, the banks, there are some banks that will lend on them, some that won't, um, but you are generally restricted to a maximum of 85%, some 80 and some even 70. So if a real estate agent's got one of these properties on the market, they can actually already have a little bit of an understanding of what type of lending you can expect on this particular property. So if, they, if they've got a stratum property, uh, stratum title property, and again, they've got someone interested who's looking to borrow 90 or 95%, they know that there's a, there's a potential to have, to have a risk or to have, you know, to have risk with the finance not going through. Um, and also by talking about this and them having their knowledge, they can say, look, we've got a broker that really understands this type of information or this type of property, I should say, sorry. Why don't you give him a call or give her a call? So again, it's just another way of making sure that your, that your referrals out there are really, they're great advocates for your knowledge and for your experience um, and that you're not afraid to share it with them. You know, this is just great information for them. Um, to help build their knowledge and understanding. Um, the other thing is as well, you know, changes with guarantors, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, with that and how it's pretty much got to be immediate family now, but all that sort of stuff. I, you're all familiar with all this sort of stuff, so I won't go too much into it, but the titles and the size restrictions are probably the most common um, that we come up against. Um, the other thing is real estate agents, everything's got to happen fast. It's got to happen straight away. Um, you know, so we try and educate them as well in why the loan process perhaps takes a fraction longer than it used to. You know, it doesn't take a great deal longer, um, but a fraction longer than it used to. And that's just summarising to them 
about all the extra work that we need to do as brokers now. You know, gone are the days of just getting a couple of pay slips and sending them in with some savings history and some ID and getting the loan. It's never going to happen. Um, we give them, we bombard them, probably our customers, with information, you know, with credit guides, credit disclosure proposal documents, all the bits and pieces that make sure that we're making sure our process is compliant. So by educating them, they already know that the customers are going to receive, you know, that they know the process that the customers are going to go through. Um, so it does take a little bit longer. In terms of banks' approvals, of course, that fluctuates depending on the bank and depending on the bank's volume. But I find that definitely in our office, from, from, from putting the application into Mercury and getting it through all the compliance and then into the lender and uploading the documents through Apply Online, it definitely is taking a lot longer. So educating again your referrer, um, just, uh, just because with them all agents go, well, if you saw them last night, why isn't it approved today? Well, you can sort of just give them a bit of an understanding of the process that's involved. Um, what else? Probably, that's probably pretty much all. Look, we do touch on the changes um, to lending for non-residents. So we give agents a bit of an understanding on that. That is probably part of the market, you know, that, that, that might have dried up for them a little bit. So we like them to understand why that may have dried up. Um, you know, just with the restrictions now on non-residents um, and that type of thing. So that just gives you a bit of a feel of the type of presentation. Yes, we have a question. Um, yeah, so just down before you move on. Oh, sure. Um, so I'll go to the next one, um, can you give a bit more information on how to sort of initiate the referral relationships? Yep, okay. Yep, I've just, just had a question on um, a little bit, uh, just to elaborate on a little bit um, more information on how to initiate the referral relationships. Um, look, when I started out, I just tried to get involved in real estate activities. So a great thing, look, a lot of real estate agents have mortgage brokers that they work with. I don't believe that they're all doing it it's all working successfully. I think that brokers probably in the past have just been a little bit complacent in the effort that they've put in. So I would approach a real estate agent, I would show them effectively what I'm showing you. I would be going through that, all these slides that we've been through to date, I'd be showing them something like this on the information that we provide to their sales teams because I'm having a discussion with, with the real estate principal, um, maybe the sales manager. Um, showing them how the information that we provide um, and then that's how I would win their confidence um, in at least getting the opportunity to sit down and talk to them. Once you sit down and talk to them, um, you're halfway there but the rest is up to you. You need to be, you need to show them that you know you will mirror or complement their, their service to their clients but the secret is getting involved um, and just showing them the benefits of using you as opposed to potentially that other mortgage broker. Um, I'm fortunate now that once you've done it once, you can leverage off existing relationships and show people how it works. So the first one's definitely, definitely gonna be the hardest. You'll probably be the most nervous. Um, but what I can recommend is that you just keep trying and you don't give up um, real estate people are notorious for being hard to get, especially the principals, because they're super, super busy. So you've just got to try and get in front of them and persevere with them. A really good way is to get one of the agents to become an advocate for you. Now, this is a little secret of mine, but I'll share it with you anyway. Um, if you are lucky enough to pick up a deal where a customer's purchased a property, um, when you've got the process underway and you're putting the application through, um, it's often great if you can make contact specifically with that real estate agent. You know, ring them and say, hi, my name's Dan Hustwaite from Aqua. I'm helping out so-and-so with the purchase of their property. Um, would you mind shooting through a copy of the contract of sale or can I just find out the best contact number from you when I order the valuation, whatever it may be. And then if you can just build a tiny little bit of a rapport with that particular agent, in their sales meeting, there's a fair chance they'll talk, you go, they'll go, you know what, 
I dealt with this broker over uh, last week. Um, he or she was just fantastic. And then if you can follow that up and maybe have that, that particular agent as an advocate in the office, that might just give you the opportunity to get into the door and talk to the principal and start working with the whole group. So that's a really good way just to take a small step to maybe getting in the door and um, discussing the, the, the opportunities with the whole real estate company. That covered that question, do you think? Yep, beautiful. Okay, all right, now what are the benefits to us? It's all good and well to, <laughs> to, sell, you know, to, to provide this, uh, this impeccable service and, 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 and pay commission or pay referral fees and all this thing, but what are the benefits to us as the broker? Now, the way I see it is, like I touched on briefly, is paying the referral fee, yep, it's a pain and it's a, it's a, it's a, it hits you in the pocket, but it's a very narrow look if you look at how your network of clients can expand. Um, back when I started, this is just a tiny bit of an example, all my leads came from real estate agents. Um, now, I actually don't take any leads at all from real estate referrers, they all are farmed out to my team um, because my client base just self-generates. Um, so that's the goal or the target that we all should be aiming for um, over the course of our careers. Now, so that's the biggest benefit in my view is the expansion of your client base. So on there, of course, you'll earn more money because you're doing more transactions, but the key bit is the significantly expanding your client base. So what I mean by that is making sure that when you receive that referrer, you nail your service, you nail it. Even if you don't know anybody, even if you've, sorry, even if you've got nothing to say to your customer or no update to provide them, our model is that we will ring our client or co make contact with our client every 48 hours. So that could just be as simple as saying, Hi, uh, so-and-so, um, just giving you a quick call to let you know that we haven't had an update yet or heard from the bank, um, but it's, we expect to hear tomorrow or we expect to hear then. So you've told them nothing, but you've called them. Um, and that's the type of thing that makes them go, you know what, the service was great. They don't feel like they're waiting for answers and that's, they're more likely then to refer, ex therefore expanding your database and expanding your, 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 your client base. Um, that flowed on to the next point, and this is something that I really am passionate about is this service thing that I keep mentioning and having, it, having your customers out there become advocates for you. Um, just to, to touch on that a little bit, something that we implemented that I've found, and some of, my, some of you may have heard this before from myself, but something that we implemented that we've had huge success with is that when we make our anniversary calls to our clients, and that is simply, um, uh, you know, hi, hi so-and-so, congratulations. Oh, just, what the spiel is, hi so-and-so, um, we're just giving you a quick call as it's been 12 months since you settled on your property. Hope everything's going well. So that's the type of anniversary call we make. But what we've implemented as part of our process is we thought about how do we make sure that our customers are talking about us to their friends on Sunday at their barbecues. So prior to making that phone call, and look, it's not quite as beneficial as it used to be, is that we would do what's put in, put in a pricing request for that customer with their existing bank. So what we'd be able to do is when we made that call, if we were able to get their discount on their professional pack from 1.2 to 1.3%, we could say, look, we've also spoken to your existing lender and we've got you an interest rate reduction. That type of thing is something that they will talk about to their friends and expand, which will expand your business and your uh, customer base because who, who does that? You know, the bank's not going to ring the customer and say, hey, guess what? You're on a 0.7 discount. We're now offering 1%. Um, they're never going to do that, ever. So if, a, if you do that for a customer and you've done that recently and they happen to be at a barbecue, you'll pick up refinances left, right and centre. And the best thing about refinances and referral from your customers, no referral fees. So that's just, a, that's just something that we implemented that we had a great deal of success with. Okay, pricing is not quite, as, uh, um, not quite the same as it was, but any customers that have got loans that are what, probably two or three or four years old or, or, or older, um, if you were to do pricing for them and ring them up on their anniversary or just not even to just do it now, just go through your old settlements, I bet you you'd get them talking to, uh, to their friends about you. Um, and what does it take you to do? It takes you five seconds to flick an email off 
to, to the bank's pricing teams. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that's important too is that it gives us the opportunity to engage uh, with our customers in the early part of the house hunting process. Now what I mean by that is you need, when you're working with real estate agents or referrers, well re let's use real estate agents, you need to make sure that they've got your information or they've got you top of mind when they're talking to people that are starting to go through open for inspections. I'll go on to vendors shortly. The key to this is making sure that your service is being introduced to them at that point in time. We find that it's, that it's, it's too late if a customer's already purchased a property at an auction and then you're referred. Good luck, you know, any savvy client out there or any savvy buyer out there's already got their finance in place. It's not gonna happen. So you need to talk to them as early as, you, as, early as possible in the process. And that is the first house that they're looking at when they've just got an interest to look to buy. So your real estate agent um, has your business cards there. You might have a brochure. We've got business cards and we've got this, um, I didn't bring one, but we've got a brochure that's, it's a DL size brochure that folds out, that shows you our panel of lenders, gives you a bit of a snippet of, of, of what we do. Um, and we have that on the table at the open for inspections. We don't put it there, we have the real estate agents put it there. So we're not attending these open for inspections, um, but we have our referral partners having that there with their other, um, with the other people that they might recommend. It might be conveyances that they work with, but putting it out with the section 32s and all their um, brochures and flyers so that it's ready, available. And by having that discussion right then and there when they've started looking, it means that you can say, okay, let's get you pre-approved. Should something that you'd like to buy come up, heck of a lot of properties in Melbourne sell for auction or sell in the form of an auction. So you know that there's no subject to finance, there's no cooling off. So we would often say, you know, look, just in case the right property comes up, how about we catch up and put in place a pre-approval? Um, I would never shy away from a pre-approval ever even if, even if the customer's seen the house, they've missed it and they're not sort of looking, I would still always try and encourage putting in place pre-approvals. The reason for, for, for us doing that is that once you've helped the customer with the pre-approval and you've done it in a reasonably quick um, time frame, chances of that customer using your service when they actually do purchase increases tenfold. Um, I, we, we would lose hardly any customers um, and they, by going to the bank directly or to another broker once we'd had a pre-approval put in place. So that's a really good way to sell your service and have the customer committed to you in one way, shape or form very, very early on um, in the piece. The other thing that I find is key with real estate agents and them referring you is when they're meeting with potential vendors. At that point in time, the vendors generally, when you call in the real estate agent for an appraisal to get a feel for what your house is worth, they actually haven't even thought finance. Yes, they know what the loan amount is, but they haven't even, they haven't even had any discussions with their bank because they don't know what the home's worth. So in those listing kits, you need to have your referral partners or your referrers have your information in there and be talking and introducing you to the vendor before they've even thought about finance. So the next call is, um, hopefully hopefully to you to yourself, um, but the next call is once they've established a value of their house, okay, well look, if we sell for this, we've got a loan of this, how much can we spend? You know, what's it gonna look like if we sell and upsize or downsize? And then you can start that dialogue with the client and then that allows you to talk to them before they've spoken to anybody else or even thought really finance. So it's another good way to get your client to commit to you um, very, very quickly. Uh, and like I said, once they've committed in terms of pre-approvals, if you do the right thing and you have a really nice follow-up system once their pre-approvals in place, you will not lose their business. Um, to elaborate on a very nice follow-up system, Mercury gives you these tools. Like Mercury, for me, I'm, I, look, I'm not a database expert, but Mercury does everything that we need it to do. Um, you know, if we put a pre-approval in place for a customer, depending on their activity and how keen they are at looking, we'll have a note go in and it's normally, you can set it automatically. So you could put the task in or once you change the status to pre-approval, 
it automatically sends this nice email with a picture and all this sort of thing saying we're near, you know, you, uh, I can't think of the exact wording, but anyway, it's a really nice email to let the client know that it's pre-approved. We'll have an automatic task set from Mercury 80 days from the pre-approval task, because most pre-approvals are valid for 90 days, so you know that 80 day task prompts you to say, look, let's get some fresh pay slips. Let's, anyway, just have a discussion with your client. And then we also have a task set generally every Friday or a week after the pre-approval's been granted so that we can send a quick text message and just say, good luck this weekend with any properties that you're looking at. Now, if you do that and you commit to doing that with all the customers that you have pre-approvals for in the system, they, you, you, you will pick up, you'll get every deal, every single deal. So that's, that's the biggest benefit of the mortgage brokers, the expansion of the expansion of your clients, people you otherwise wouldn't meet, but there are a few key service levels that you must tick to make sure that that continues very, 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 very um, effectively. Okay, the referral process and client manager, client management. Now we've talked a little bit about this, um, so I won't have to talk about every single point, I don't think, but I'll touch on some of them. Okay, so the referral partner to provide bro broker with client details. I touched on that, it's extremely important to make sure that the referral partner is giving you the customer's details to chase or follow up or call. It will not work if, you, um, if, you are ring, if you're waiting for these, for, these, for these potential customers to ring you. It just, it just doesn't work, in my view. It doesn't work well. Um, when you do receive a lead, you must ring the customer in accordance with the advice from the referrer. The referrer might, like I had a lead on Sunday and, I had a, and, I, and it came through on an email um, and it said, hi Daniel, you know, rah, 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 uh, if possible, can you please make contact the, t this afternoon? I did. So on su I said to you, I don't take any real estate leads, but if we do get leads through on a Sunday, I don't expect my guys to really make that initial contact uh, because Sunday we, we, you know, we're technically not working, so I'll happily make the initial contact. But then generally speaking, I'm not in the office, so I'll be saying, look, just giving you a call to let you know that so-and-so passed on your details. Uh, I mentioned it might be okay to talk about some loan options. Um, they'll say, yeah, great, thanks for calling. I'll say, look, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm not in the office, but I'll organise so-and-so from the team to, um, to give you a buzz on Monday. So that's the general spiel. But at least then we've contacted the, 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 the customer so the referrer knows that we've been prompt in our action. So client to be contacted same day, that's what that means, just in accordance with the advice from the referrer. Okay, when we meet with clients, we provide them with an information pack. So we have a lovely little, a lovely folder, a little bit bigger than an A4, it's in our branding. In there we've got our brochures, our flyers, our business cards, our credit guide. So just that type of information. Um, we, tr we tried to have it look nice. Real estate agents have a beautiful presentation kit that they do when they're listing homes. Um, so we just tried to complement that. Uh, the entire process is relationship managed um, end to end. So what that simply means is that the way in which we deal with our customers is we, you know, everybody does it. You have to manage the process right from the start to the finish. So we don't, if, if I was the broker that organised the loan for a client, yes, I have someone assist with an admin point of view in terms of um, submitting applications and making the phone calls to the bank and following up the status, but we've got to make sure that your client's always comfortable to ring you at any stage, at any time throughout the whole transaction, not only prior to the loan being approved, but in years to come. Um, some of the things that we do post settlement, which we find is very successful, is when you are lucky enough to be introduced to a customer from a referral, again, it's complementing their service. You know, it's simply making a quick phone call one month after settlement. If you're not making them, have someone in the office make them, it doesn't really, it probably doesn't matter. The standard spiel uh, that I would use in that example is, hi, it's been uh, 30 days since you settled, or it's been one month since you settled on your property, just checking in to see how it's going. The key to that is just making sure that the direct debits are set up and everything's going well. Three month call, so that's just the same thing. Um, six month call and then your anniversaries. Uh, we use Connectives Marketing. I think it's a wonderful tool. Uh, you know, again, it complements updates that real estate agents provide, and we also have our referrers in our database to receive this marketing. So our referrers receive the RBA updates, and they receive the Connectives um, monthly EMAG that they help help 
uh, help produce. Um, so our referrers also receive that information. Uh, and that pricing I touched on before. So that just gives you a really good summary of the type of things that we do. A couple of other points that I'd like to touch on firstly is if you are successful in setting up a relationship with a referrer or a real estate agent, I would suggest that you organise some time to actually, or put aside some time or encourage the referrer to allow you to sit in their office. We do find that if you're not sitting in the real estate office or there's not, a, there's not an immediate uh, Real estate agents, need they, they act fast and, and, and if, if, it helps you stay top of mind to the referrer if you're in their office and you're sitting there. Um, we sort of make it, not, I don't, we don't say it's compulsory, but I strongly suggest or I strongly recommend that we can at least have a desk in their office for two, one, two or three days per week. Um, it's not full time and of course the, the space is permitting, but our strike rate in terms of the volume of leads increases massively um, if we've got presence in their office. That type of presentation that I showed you that we give to our referrals is done at their sales meetings. So we give them information at their sales meetings. Of course I, I don't take up too much time, I sort of burn through it. I might give them a copy of that slide, but that works very, very well. Another principle of mine or another rule that I've implemented, and I find that it gives the referrer a heck of a lot of confidence in referring you, is that we do not work with any real estate agents that compete in the same area. So my main office is in Eltham, we work with Morris and Kleeman. If a Barry Plant or someone else came to us and said, look, you know, we can see what you're doing here, it seems to be working, you know, some of the agents might have Agents move around from office to office a little bit, so you might get an introduction there. Um, I'd just say, look, I'm just say something along the lines of, look, I'm, this is if you adopt this model, of course. Um, I'd say, look, I'm very privileged that you've come and asked, uh, and we would absolutely love to, but we've made a commitment to our existing referring partner um, that we just will be working with them. The reason that that's so effective in my view is if a customer comes back to you and often asks you to crunch the numbers before they speak to their real estate agent, we'll often absolutely, well not often, we will mention that why don't you speak to, um, why don't you speak to so and so from uh, Morrison Cleveland or you know Gary Peer or one of those real estate agents that referred us to get, to, to get a bit of an indication on what their home might be worth. They might like to hang on to the property so you'd say oh why don't you ring um, so and so who refer you know who put us in, t in uh, put us in touch with one another um, and get a rental appraisal done if you want to keep the property so the agents then are very very comfortable in knowing that if the customer comes back to you you're not you, you're also not taking leads and having a, a really close relationship with people that might want to do business a few times in that same area so that's a big success yes we have a question um, do you in your experience do you feel it's worth focusing on to suburbs, rural areas, or just metro? Or oh. All right, in my experience, um, oh, sorry, the question was, uh, in my experience, do, we, uh, do I feel that it's better to focus on referral sources in metropolitan Melbourne or out of suburbs or even in rural areas? Um, I wouldn't shy away from, look, demographically, it's a challenge. You know, our, we don't, we, we go and see a lot of our customers, so, you know, you can, you can only do certain a number, certain amount of Ks. So if you're working on, for example, my model is that um, each broker, I try and place brokers demographically to the referrer because if you've got to spend so much time in the car, well, it's just, it's just, it's just, not, a, it's just not an efficient way to spend your time. To answer the question directly, like, I'll talk to any referrer anywhere, um, but to get the model right, it might take some time to find somebody that's suitable in that demographic or someone that lives close to that demographic. We work, as the, the agents that we work with, um, Chisholm and Gaiman have an office in Mount Martha um, and we also work with someone in Point Cook and Morris and Cleman out in Eltham. It's impossible, it'd be impossible for me to give that referrer's customers the just service and being able to see them in a timely fashion. So I'd absolutely, um, encourage you to talk to all referrers um, in all areas. Uh, look, if you were starting out now, I would see a great opportunity in some of those 
bigger areas, like Morris and Kleeman, I've, I've used them a few times, but they have an office in Doreen, and Doreen's sort of northeastern area. It's a bit like a Pakenham and a, and, and a Melton, and there's a lot of new housing subdivisions. And there's certainly, I would say, a lot of opportunity to be able to um, pick up a lot of business from getting referrals from there. A really key thing or a very important little message that I find has worked well for us in the Doreen area is get onto their community Facebook page. Become a member of their community Facebook page. And as soon as you, I don't think, you're not allowed to advertise on all of them, but you can subtly suggest what you do and how you do it. And on those community Facebook pages, you'll often see them post something, oh, can so-and-so recommend a good broker? So that's a good little tool. Okay, do we have any other questions? Um, yep. Yes, do you think it's better to pay referral fees to the principal or the agents, or do you, which do you do? Okay, the question is, do you, do you think it's better to pay the referral fees to the principals or the agents? I think it's better to pay it to the agents, but if we start doing any trail, that'll go to the principals. So that'll be a reason for the principals to keep encouraging their agents to use our service. But I think it's important that the agent out on the ground gets the referral fee. That model that I showed you there, if there's a loan for a million dollars and we pay a thousand dollars, I'd also be happy to see the agent receive 800 of it and the principal receive 200 of it. I'd probably pretty much leave it up to them. But if we were to implement a bit of a trail um, option for our referrers, I'd be paying that to the principal, not the agent. Any other questions? No, that's it. no? do you want me to go? If we've got some more time, three more minutes. Okay, well, I've got a few questions that we received um, prior to today. So I'll just read the first one. Um, a system for staying in touch after the initial contact has been made to ensure there is a back end to the process. So what I read from that is how do you, firstly, how do you administer the payments of the commissions to the real estate agents? Um, now, Mercury gives you these tools. It's very, very easy for you to set up a referrer in Mercury. I think you do it under the payee tab, I think. Anyway, um, talk to Connective about doing that the way that you need to. You can, it's very simple. You can set them up and then you can allocate the amount of commission that you would like that particular customer. Um, sorry, just let me get this right. You can allocate the amount of commission for that particular customer to be paid to the real estate agent. So that Mercury absolutely gives you that opportunity. In terms of knowing where you're getting your referrals from, um, you can also, you can put in their lead source. Um, that's very, very simple um, as well, um, so that you can identify who's referring you the most and who you should be focusing on. Um, how do brokers, uh, next question. How do brokers overcome the conflict um, of interest issue in a situation where the referred client is ineligible for a loan? Um, good question, but it's pretty easy to answer. I would just simply be honest. Um, you know, if, you, if the customer's ineligible for a loan and the loan's declined, you know, whilst you don't directly go and tell the real estate agent, you know, the loan's declined, but if, if, you, if you explain it to the customer, they'll let the agent know for you anyway. Um, so just don't say that the customer's been declined. One of, the, one of the things that frustrates me though is how do you explain to a customer that your loan's been knocked back purely on uh, bank's credit scoring? They go, what, what does that even mean? You know, and when I think about it, I think, well, I don't really know how to explain that either. But you can certainly say, you know, affordability may, may, may not be there. So just try and explain to your clients why there was a decline and just tell them the truth. Um, and then you'll find that that will be relayed to the referral source um, and it'll keep, it, uh, keep, keep, keep the whole relationship very amicable. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks for having me today. Um, I hope you found it interesting and, and, th and there's a few little tips and things that you can um, implement in your businesses that might help you uh, along the way. Good luck, thank you. Yeah.